Okay. Huh. I can't believe that this is our penultimate week. We only have one more week left in the course. Um, I don't know about you, but the time has just flown by. I just can't believe we're at week 14 or sorry, week 13 already. Um, yeah. So there we go. So today I want to talk about macroeconomics in the short run. I will be doing some pretty standard neoclassical economics. Um, I will be distinguishing between the classical equilibrium and the Keynesian equilibrium. So it will be drilling down a little bit on some of the stuff. Professor Sachs introduced the concept of aggregate demand and aggregate supply, but because he had so much stuff to cover uh, in his um, epic uh, lecture from Tuesday, um, he didn't drill down into what determines aggregate demand and aggregate supply. And I will do that. Um, so again, like last week, this is a little more traditional economics. Uh, we're doing this not because I think that it's right. I do not think the classical way of looking at things is, is the right way, but because it's so, one, because it's so common, so you need to, you should probably know it. And second, because it sets a good benchmark as to you know, what we're criticizing. Um, when I'll discuss the classical equilibrium, uh, aggregate supply and aggregate demand, this is what John Maynard Keynes criticized heavily in 1936 when he wrote his book, The General Theory of Employment, Interest and Money. Um, and so we'll discuss uh, a little bit about that. And then we'll discuss a little bit about monetary policy and fiscal policy in, in very general terms. Um, again, I, I, I never know how long these classes are going to run. My guess is this, this probably will not run for the whole class. So we can have a, some time for discussion at the end. Um, I'd certainly like that uh, because the unfortunate thing about these Zoom classes is that you just don't get much of a chance to have a back and forth discussion. It's just really hard to do that on Zoom. Um, yeah, and uh, the, the final will be on, as I mentioned last week, the week it's on the 11th, uh, I believe the Tuesday morning at 9.30. I believe it's two hours, but I need to uh, figure that out. Alexi, do you know if it is it two hours? It's two hours. So it's 9.30 to 11.30. So we'll figure out, uh, uh, I'll talk to Professor Sachs and figure out uh, what kind of exam it's going to be and the structure. And we let you know within a few days because I think I think you should know in advance what kind of what kind of final that is, but uh, nothing to worry about. Uh, exams are never as important as you think they are uh, in the long run, uh, and certainly the point of this course is not to catch you out on exam questions. It's to look at a whole new. It's it's to develop a whole new structure, a whole new framework of looking at economics. Okay, let me share the screen and we we'll start before I, st so I stop rattling on. But Tony, in the long run, we're all dead. Yes, Keynes did say that, yes. Okay, so week 13, we're gonna talk about um, and the, the starting point to talk about um, the, um, the we're, going, we're going to start with the labor market, uh, the demand for labor and the supply of labor. Um, again, this is a very neoclassical way of looking at the world. And the, the first point I want you to put in your heads before we start this is to recall what marginal products are and diminishing marginal products. So the marginal product of capital is the extra unit, extra output from one extra unit of capital. The marginal product of labor is the extra output from one extra unit of labor. But there's diminishing marginal products. As capital increases, the marginal product of capital falls. As labor increases, the marginal product of labor falls. So the marginal product of labor is a downward sloping line. Think of it like think of it like that. Well, relative to labor. Now, 
here I want to discuss uh, what labor demand looks like in in the in the um, in, uh, in the, the classical model. And the classical model assumes competitive markets. It assumes perfect competition. Let's get that assumption out there right away uh, because it's an unrealistic assumption. Um, but one reason why economists love this assumption so much is that it's simple and the math works out really simply. So let's assume you are a firm and you're trying to maximize your profits. Now, again, remember, this goes against what we said earlier about that the goal of economics is not so much maximization, but uh, perfection, uh, in a sense, going back to Aristotle and Aquinas. And the goal of the firm is not what Milton Friedman says, that you should be maximizing your profits equated with your shareholder value. You should have wider sense of social responsibility. I think everybody in this class believes that, and it's certainly instilled into you at Fordham Business School, which is very important. But for now, let's just put that to one side for a second and assume that we're in a very classical model where we have competitive markets, perfect competition, and you are maximizing profits. So profits is that little pie is profits. Profits is your output times the price times the value of your output. So that's price times the volume of your output, PY, minus your wage bill, the wage W and labor, the number of workers L. So your wage bill minus your return on capital. So R is your return on capital and K is capital. So if you think of your profits is what's left over after you pay, after you produce your output, you pay your labor and you impute some kind of return on capital. Um, and then your profit is what's left over. So, and of course, Y, as we know, is F of K and L. It's a function of capital and labor. So to maximize something, you take its derivative and set it to zero. So let's choose what, um, what, uh, what labor, what, what amount of labor would you choose to maximize profits? Well, if you take the derivative of the pi dl, delta pi delta l, you get price and the, sorry, I've switched, I've switched accidentally from big P to small P. That was, that's, that's a mistake, P is P. P times, and the der derivative of um, taking the derivative of the production function with respect to labor, well, that's MPL, that's your marginal product of labor. And minus W, because you do differentiate um, WL by L, you get W. And if you set that equal to zero, then it says your marginal product of labor is equal to W over P, which is the real wage. And that's gonna be very important because what really matters is not so much the nominal wage, but it's the purchasing power of your, of your wages. So the real wage, W over P, the wage divided by the price level. Um, no, not yet. Um, if so, if the marginal product of labor is higher than the real wage, then if you can hire more workers, you get higher profits. So basically, you maximize profits when you set the marginal product of labor equal to the real wage. So if the margin, so to repeat that, let's assume that MPL is greater than W over P, then you can hire more workers and get more profits because uh, you, their, your productivity is higher. So this gives you the labor demand curve. We already showed, I already mentioned at the beginning that when L goes up, the marginal product of labor goes down. But the marginal product of labor in this competitive classical equilibrium is equal to the real wage. So the labor demand curve slopes down. The labor demand curve is the demand for labor. You have the real wage W over P on one axis and you have L on the other axis, the horizontal axis. So it slopes downwards. And then you can get the market labor demand curve as the sum of all the individual labor demands. Now, what does this mean? This means that in this particular model, the real wage earned by all workers is equal to 
the increase in output generated by the last worker in the economy. That's the marginal product of labor. So there is a direct link between real wages and productivity. If productivity is higher, the real wage is higher. If productivity is lower, the real wage is lower. Now, in a certain sense, that's pretty intuitive, right? You would expect um, if you're more productive, you can you earn more wages. Um, the problem with that is it often, for many classical and neoclassical economists, it gives a moral justification for the distribution of income. It says that, well, if your real wage is low, it's because your productivity is low. So it can say that you're paid whatever you're worth on the market. But this is a very impoverished way of looking at worth. It's not about human dignity. It's not about all the ethical um, uh, frameworks that we discussed in previous classes. It reduces it very simply to saying that your worth or your real wage is basically based on your productivity and you're paid what you're worth. So that's a real problem with this framework. And also, as you, as you know, uh, as I mentioned before, maybe I should have put the chart up, but I, I didn't download it. Um, in the post-war era, there was indeed a link between productivity and wages. So as productivity rose, real wages rose. There was a link. But what happened since around 1980 or so, a big gap emerged between productivity in the economy and real wages. Productivity rose dramatically, but real wages did not rise. Real wages stagnated. And instead, cap the returns to capital or profits rose instead. So what this framework does cannot do is it can capture power. It can capture the ability of the firm to exercise power over workers, especially when they don't have unions to bargain on their behalf. So that's a real failure of this model, which you can see why classical economists like it because it's really simple. The math is simple and it gives you a very simple intuitive result that the marginal product of labor is equal to the real wage. So labor demand and labor supply. So I said the labor demand curve reflects the marginal product of labor. What about the labor supply curve? Well, we're going to make a very simple assumption here. If demand curves slope down, then supply curves slope up. So as the real wage rises, you supply more labor. Now, but that's not as straightforward or as simple as you might think, because there are two effects here. And those of you who've done neoclassical microeconomics will remember the distinction between substitution effects and income effects. So what you have here as the real wage is changing is a choice between do you work more or do you take more leisure? Um, and one side says, if the wage increases, if, sorry, if the real wage increases, you work more, right? The incentive to work has increased. That's the substitution effect. It reflects an opportunity cost. The opportunity cost of leisure has risen. So you take less leisure, you work more. You substitute towards working harder because real wages are higher. But there's also the income effect that says, well, you're richer because your real wage is higher, so you can take more leisure. Uh, in technical terms, it says leisure is a normal good. As income rises, you consume more leisure. Um, so it moves the other. So these two effects move in two different directions. So we don't know realistically how this labor supply curve is going to, whether it's going to be upward sloping or downward sloping. Now we're going to assume that it slopes upwards because that's probably the most realistic way to do it. 
but just to keep in mind that it's a bit more complicated than that. So this is the labor market. My apologies, you're going to see a few more in this class. You're going to see a few more of my cheesy uh, drawings. Um, uh, apologies for that. Uh, my ability to draw is atrocious. Um, and this is the labor market. So real wage on one axis and uh, labor on the other axis. So labor demand slopes downwards, labor supply slopes upwards, and we get an equilibrium L star and we get an equilibrium W over P star. And we can then look at, look at little experiments as to what would happen if you shift the labor demand or labor supply curve. Uh, I think a really interesting one uh, from history, uh, I'll just mention this because it's a, a very interesting experiment. In the mid 40, what happened in Europe in the mid 14th century, around 1347 to 1349? Well, you had the Black Death, you had bubonic plague, um, where estimates suggest that at least half of the population of Europe died and Asia died uh, from bubonic plague. So it was a, a unbelievably awful pandemic. Uh, but what, what that meant is, well, you had, much, you had far fewer workers. So think of the labor supply curve sloping upwards to backwards to the left. So what would that mean is, so there are fewer workers, but those workers that are left are more productive and they have higher real wages. So if you were one of the lucky people to survive the Black Death, you did pretty well. You were richer uh, because there are fewer workers around and the wages increase. And we saw that is exactly what happened. And what happened is the ruling class didn't like the fact that real wages were rising. So they tried to legislate uh, wages. They tried to legislate what workers could earn for various tasks. And you had a lot of discontent. In 1381, you had the peasants revolt, a huge revolt uh, of, of peasants who were basically complaining about the fact that their wages were being held down. So a very real life uh, experiment from a very simple little model of labor demand and labor supply. We are now going to use that model to talk about the classical and Keynesian uh, equilibria. We will talk about the classical model, which is going to assume that markets work. Markets work in the sense that wages and prices are always flexible and will take you back to equilibrium. And that, as I will show you in a minute, that leads to an aggregate supply curve that is vertical. We will talk about what happens when you have increased more capital or more technology, which shifts the aggregate supply curve outwards. We'll talk about the Keynesian model where markets are not so, don't, do not work so well that wages and prices are not fully flexible. And that gives you, sorry, that's a typo. The, uh, that should say aggregate supply curve slopes upwards, not aggregate demand curve. So please, please, I'll change that uh, before I post it to Blackboard. And economists often use the Keynesian aggregate supply for short run and the classical aggregate supply for long run. I'll just, okay. Here's what I mean by the classical equilibrium. So let's, let's, let's talk our way through this diagram. So at the bottom, you have labor demand and labor supply, and you have equilibrium level of employment, L star, and equilibrium level of real wage, W over P star. If you go up to the, above that, you have our old friend, the production function, which we talked about in great detail last week. And the production function says, if you have an L, an L star, that gives you a level of output, Y star, assuming that everything else is constant and everything else being capital and technology. And that's Y star. And then I want to argue that the aggregate supply curve is vertical, that that Y star is fixed no matter 
where the price is. So the price could be higher or the price could be lower. Uh, but Y star doesn't change. Why is that? Well, let's assume that price rises. What happens if price rises? Well, first thing that happens is W over P, the real wage falls. So the real wage falls. That means that labor demand is greater than labor supply. But if you believe in fully flexible wages, and if you believe in competitive markets where they always return to equilibrium, that's going to bid up wages. So the, way, the nominal wage, W, rises by the exact same amount, the exact same percentage as the price level, P. So W over P does not change. Therefore, L star does not change. Therefore, Y star does not change. So aggregate supply is vertical. Price can, and we can do the same thing if price, if price falls. If price falls, the real wage rises. Labor supply is greater than labor demand. Uh, there are more workers out there competing with each other. So that bids the nominal wage down and you go back to W over P star, you go back to L star, you go back to Y star, and your aggregate supply curve is vertical. This is the classical equilibrium, and it's predicated on the key assumption that wages and prices are fully flexible. They will move in response to market forces, they will move in response to competitive forces, and they will always go back to equilibrium. Now let's look at some experiments. This kind of, is a, let's, assume you e let's assume you either shift the capital stock or technology, it doesn't matter which one, they have the same effects. Well, you have two effects. Well, the first one is the labor demand curve shifts out. Uh, why? It's because each worker is now suddenly more productive because there's more capital or there's more know-how or technological know-how. So each worker is more productive. So the labor demand curve shifts from LD1 to LD2. So that means, and also at the top level, the production function shifts out because remember this production function is drawn um, for Y and L, holding constant everything else, holding constant capital and technology. So if capital increases or technology gets better, that production function is going to shift out. So you have two effects going on. You have labor demand shifting out. You have the production function shifting up. So what does that do? Well, you get more workers, L star one moves to L star two, you get higher real wages, um, L, uh, W over P star one goes upwards to W over P star two, um, you get higher output. So Y star one moves to Y star two and the aggregate supply curve shifts outwards. It's still vertical, because we're still in this classical model, which you get higher uh, aggregate supply. Um, so this is basically saying in the classical model, the, the way you can get higher output is really through better, more capital. And we discussed that in great detail last week with the solo growth model, more capital or more technology. So this is very much a supply side view of the economy. Okay, that's a shift of capital or technology. Now let's look at the Keynesian way of looking at the same model. The Keynesian model, and again, we're gonna keep a lot of the same assumptions just to keep it simple, not because we think they're realistic, but to keep it simple. The Keynesian model says that aggregate supply slopes upwards. 
and you can see it there on the right hand side aggregate supply slopes upwards why well it's due to what we call sticky nominal wages let's assume that wages do not adjust back to equilibrium so let's assume that the price falls from p0 to p1 falls well in the classical equilibrium sorry that's going to a high, a, sorry, a lower price is going to lead to a higher real wage. Okay, W over P zero or star shifts to W over P one, a higher real wage. Now, in the classical model, that would basically say your labor supply is greater than your labor demand. That bids down wages, so you go back to L star. But in the Keynesian model, that is not what happens. The nominal wage is not flexible, it's stuck, it's rigid. And that can be, you can assume any number of reasons for that. Um, there is a social norm against cutting wages. You have a union to stop the wage, you have a minimum wage, there's any kind of reason, or simply that wages don't adjust in real time. You're, you know, it takes a long time to figure out whether prices have risen or prices have fallen. You got to figure it out. You got to work it out. You got to negotiate it. So it's just the, the, the classical idea that uh, wages adjust simultaneously and you're always in equilibrium is just not realistic. This is the Keynesian model. So what happens here is you, you're stuck at a higher wage um, and you have unemployment that gap between labor demand and labor supply is unemployment. Um, and, and your level of employment L is L1. It's lower than L star. That gives you Y1, which is lower than Y star. So you can see an upward sloping aggregate supply curve. We started at P star, Y star. We lowered the price to P1, and we, we, and we show that that gives you a lower level of output Y1. So due to these wages being sticky, we have shown that the aggregate supply curve slopes upwards. So Keynesian equilibrium, classical equilibrium, vertical aggregate supply curve, Keynesian equilibrium, upwardly sloping aggregate supply curve. Now, some economists like to say the classical vertical aggregate supply curve is more realistic in the long run because firms and workers understand what's going on with prices, they adjust their wages. So in the long run, the aggregate supply curve is vertical, but in the short run, the aggregate supply curve slopes upwards because wages do not adjust in real time. They are, they're rigid. Um, okay. Let's now, so we have discussed aggregate supply. Now let's introduce aggregate demand. And I want to argue that aggregate demand curve slopes downwards. In all models of the economy, aggregate demand curve slopes downwards. And what's aggregate demand? Well, we know this, C plus I plus G, the consumption, the purchase of goods and services, the, in, the investment, um, the purchase of capital goods and factories and machines and things like that by firms. And G is government purchases, you know, government buying things or hiring new teachers, things like that. We're going to assume, for now, we just assume, keep it simple. Uh, we don't have uh, net exports on that, but we could add net exports, exports minus imports uh, for an open economy. But I'm just going to keep it simple for now. Why does the aggregate demand curve slopes downwards? Well, there's a number of reasons. Um, and by the way, if you have done uh, neoclassical macroeconomics before, you might have done this in terms of ISLM, um, different curves. 
We are not going to do ISLM here because it's not necessary to explain what we want to explain, but that's a very standard way of deriving a downwardly sloped aggregate supply, sorry, downwardly sloped aggregate demand curve. I keep confusing my demand and supply this morning. I apologize. Um, so why does the aggregate demand curve slope downwards? Well, the first reason is called the real balance effect. That simply says if you have lower prices, you feel richer. So the desired level of purchases increase. Lower prices, you want to buy more stuff. Therefore, uh, your consumption goes up. So your aggregate supply, sorry, <laughs> doing it again. Your aggregate demand curve is sloped downwards. There's also an effect from the money market. And if you've done this, you know, if you do the LM curve, this is where this is coming from. Um, if prices are lower, you don't need to hold as much money. Things are cheaper. You don't need to hold as much money. So what do you do with that money? Well, you lend, you can lend some of it out. You can do that by buying a bond or putting that money in a savings account. But what that does is that drives down interest rates. Um, you're lending out more money that drives down interest rates. And if interest rates are lower, consumption and investment increase. Why? Because, well, investment increases because interest rates are lower uh, for obvious reasons, but also consumption especially of consumer durables, things like you want to buy a thing like a car. If the interest rate is lower, it's cheaper to buy that car, uh, hopefully an EV. And um, so, so what this basically says is that, again, it shows that aggregate demand slopes downwards due to the money market effect. If price falls, demand goes up. There are also, there are also effects from the net exports part, which we kind of ignoring here, but I'll mention it anyway. In open economies, a price fall, a lower price means it's now less expensive to buy domestic goods. So people import less and consume more domestic goods. So again, for this reason, aggregate demand slopes downwards. What about shifts? to aggregate demand. So, you know, we always distinguish between movements along a curve and shifts of the curve. What shifts the curve? Well, basically exogenous changes in C or I or G. So let's assume, so something that, let's assume that um, there's an exogenous change in consumption, like a stock market boom, everybody's richer, so you consume more, that will shift out the aggregate demand curve. Um, an exogenous change in investment. So firms invest more, they purchase more capital goods because there's more optimism about the future. Professor Sachs mentioned that John Maynard Keynes referred to that as animal spirits. Um, confidence has increased. So you will invest more. Like, for example, it's possible to argue that firms will say in the current climate that vaccines are rolling out at a fast pace in the US. That means people are going to be, are going to want to get out and spend money. Therefore, I'm going to invest more now because I'm confident about the future. Um, but this is very much subject to whims and waves of optimism and pessimism. And then, of course, you can shift aggregate demand through changes in what the government does through government purchases or taxation. Uh, and we'll talk about that in, in, in a minute. Um, and that, so if you increase G, if you increase government spending, you shift out aggregate demand. That's basic fiscal policy. Um, okay. Very good. Aggregate demand in the Keynesian and classical models. Well, 
in the classical model, aggregate supply is vertical. So if you're increasing aggregate demand, you get an increase in prices and not an increase in output. But in the Keynesian model, the increase in aggregate demand, you get an increase in both prices and output. So in the Keynesian model, fiscal policy can give you real effects. In the classical model, it can't. And that's a key difference from a policy perspective. Let's look at the picture. So the top of this is the classical model with a vertical aggregate supply curve. Shifting aggregate demand out, let's assume it's due to higher government spending, for example. Well, this basically says that all that happens is prices go up because Remember, you are in an equilibrium whereby the labor market is fully flexible. Wages adjust to prices. Labor doesn't change. And if labor doesn't change, output doesn't change. So all you get is higher prices. So this would argue that trying to stimulate aggregate demand in the economy is going to backfire because all that happens is you get inflation and you get no change in output. That's the classical model. In the Keynesian model, it's very different because the aggregate supply curve, remember, because nominal wages are sticky, the aggregate supply curve is sloped upwards. This means that if we stimulate aggregate demand, we get higher output and higher prices. So basically, aggregate demand management can actually work. You can get yourself out of a recession by stimulating aggregate demand. That was the big insight of John Maynard Keynes. Let's look at what happens when, so that's when aggregate demand changes. What if aggregate supply changes? Well, in the, you get basically similar effects in both models. If aggregate demand, if aggregate supply is shifting outwards and remember, why would aggregate supply be shifting out? It's due to things like a higher capital stock or better technology, better technological progress. Then you get higher output and lower prices. You get the best of both worlds. Supply shocks are good. Technological progress is good in both of these models, whether you're classical or Keynesian, a shift out in aggregate supply gives you a higher output and lower prices. By the way, we can reverse this experiment and say what happens if aggregate supply shifts backwards. Um, let's say you have a negative supply shock and this is often, we often argue that this is what happened in the 1970s as oil prices rose dramatically and aggregate supply shifted from AS1 to AS0. It's like a negative supply shock. So you get lower output and higher prices. Thinking of Y1 falls to Y0 and P1 rises to P0. And that is often called stagflation. Stagflation is when you get a recession and inflation at the same time. You get the worst of both worlds. And that's what happened in the 1970s because of a negative supply shock due to the um, higher oil prices. Okay, so we've done demand shocks and we've done supply shocks. Now let's delve a little deeper into monetary and fiscal policy. Well, monetary policy is one element of stimulative aggregate demand. And this is when, when the Fed wants to stimulate the economy, it basically lowers the short-term interest rate, which usually causes the long-term interest rate to fall too, which encourages households to buy more durable goods like cars or household goods. And then causes firms to invest more in plants and equipment and equipment. So C rises, 
and I rises, aggregate demand shifts outwards uh, due to lower interest rates. Uh, how, in fact, do you lower the interest rate? Well, I'm just going to repeat a point that Professor Sachs mentioned on Tuesday. You do it through open market operations. So basically, to increase the money supply, the Federal Reserve will buy bonds from the public. You buy those bonds from the public and you pay for those bonds in dollars. And what happens to those dollars? Well, some of those dollars are held as currency by people and some of those dollars are held in banks. Um, what is deposited in banks can be, can be lent out to people and you have something called a money multiplier, which means that every dollar deposited in a bank leads to more than more dollars, a uh, higher number of dollars lent out. So, and that's going to lower interest rates and stimulate the economy. Um, the classical model says that in the long run, money is neutral. In other words, all that happens if you increase the money supply is you get an increase in prices. And this is called the quantity equation, MV equals PY. Professor Sachs introduced it briefly in one of his very last slides. So M is the supply of money. V is the velocity of circulation, the speed at which that money is circulating through the economy. And PY is nominal output, the price level times real output. So, in the Keynesian, if you think of V as constant for now, V the velocity is constant. That says a higher M gives you a higher PY. More money in circulation, higher level of money supply gives you higher level of nominal output, either or higher prices or higher real output. Now Remember, in the classical model, Y is fixed in the long run. Remember, we talked about that just a few minutes ago. The aggregate supply curve is vertical. Therefore, if you increase aggregate demand, all that happens is you get higher prices. So this is the neutrality of money. It says that in the long run, if you increase M, all that happens is you get an increase in P. The Keynesians come back and say, as Jim said earlier, in the long run, we're all dead. So we need to focus on the short run. And in the short run, you can get higher M leading to both higher prices and higher output. So you can stimulate the economy through uh, increasing the supply of money. And since the 20, 2008 recession, the Fed has been very active in stimulating the economy through lowering interest rates. Interest rates are at record lows. And I think there is strong evidence that that has increased output. It certainly hasn't increased prices. Uh, that's for a very complicated reason that we're not going to get into uh, right now. Okay, that's monetary policy. Let's turn to fiscal policy. Fiscal policy is basically changes in G, government spending, uh, taxes, or transfers, transfers like unemployment assistance or um, different kind of uh, transfer payments to households. First thing we need to do is distinguish between discretionary fiscal policy and automatic stabilizers. Discretionary fiscal policy is a change in G or T that the government decides to do um, for example, uh, President Biden has proposed an increase in government spending on child care, on infrastructure, on a lot of different things. And he's proposed to do it by raising taxes on corporations and the wealthiest individuals. That's discretionary fiscal policy. It's changes in G and its changes in T. Automatic stabilizers is fiscal policy that happens all on its own. 
uh, without a legislative act of government. And it's, it's fiscal policy that automatically offsets economic fluctuations. For example, if you have a recession, unemployment benefits are higher. So that kind of neutralizes part of the bad effects of the recession, but it's not something that's legislated through discretionary fiscal policy, it just happens. That's an automatic stabilizer. Now, as I mentioned, you can increase government purchases, G, you can change taxes, T, or you can increase transfers. And you can have a fiscal expansion or a fiscal contraction. Now, here's a big difference between monetary and fiscal policy. Monetary policy works through lowering the interest rate. Fiscal policy, it is often argued, raises the interest rate if you're borrowing the money. And that's very simple. If you're borrowing money, that increases the demand for borrowed funds and increases interest rates. Um, of course, if you're paying for it through rising in taxes, you generally do not get that effect. Right, let's look at, I wanna look at something called the Keynesian multiplier. The Keynesian multiplier says that if you're increasing fiscal policy, discretionary fiscal policy, government spending or taxes, you get an, a change in output that is greater than the increase in that spending or taxes. So let's just look at this. This is just a little bit of simple math. This is not, this is not complicated math. This is not like the solar model. It's very simple. Y equals C plus I plus G. C consumption, let's just say consumption is a function of disposable income. Disposable income is Y, your income minus taxes. And B is called the marginal propensity to consume. Let's say that if B is 0.8, this says you consume 80% of your income and you save 20% of it if B is 0.8. If B is 0.75, you, set, you consume three quarters of your income and you save a quarter of it. So if that's what C is, we just plug that in. Y equals B times Y minus T plus I plus G. Let's assume I and G are fixed for now. Bring, it, bring over the one minus B, one minus B times Y equals minus BT plus I plus G. Therefore, Y equals G over one minus B minus B over one minus B times T plus I over one minus B. What we're interested in here is what happens when G changes and what happens when T changes. The government spending multiplier is one over one minus B. Think of what's delta Y is one over one minus B times delta G. So for example, if the multiplier, if, if the marginal propensity to consume B is 0.75, the multiplier is one over one minus 0.75, one over 0.25, which is four. So this basically says that if you increase government spending by $1, you will increase your overall output in the economy by $4. And the Keynesian multiplier works because, you know, every dollar spent gets propagated through the economy. This is the Keynesian multiplier. As more people spend it, everybody's spending is income to other people who will spend who will income to other people who will keep spending and this propagates through the economy. The tax multiplier, remember, is minus B over one minus B. If you raise or cut taxes, the effect you're gonna have on output is B over one minus B or technically minus B over one minus B. So again, if we assume that B is 0.75, 
the multiplier now is not four, the multiplier is three. And um, the multiplier is lower because some of the tax cut, let's assume you cut taxes, some of the tax cut is saved. It's not all spent. This is why you often are, you often hear economists, especially Keynesian economists, argue that government spending is more effective than cutting taxes because it has a bigger effect on output. When you change G, you are not, it's a direct transfer of $1 into the economy, which propagates throughout the economy in line with the Keynesian multiplier. But when you change T, if you cut taxes, you're only consuming part of it and you're saving part of it. So your multiplier is lower. There's also something called the balanced budget multiplier. Let's assume that, well, what happens if you raise G, you raise government spending, which you also raise taxes by the same amount. So you fully pay for your spending. And this is something of a counterintuitive result. You still get a multiplier. Uh, the multiplier is one because the, the, because the multiplier, because think of it's four minus, in this case, it's four minus three, uh, because the multiplier for government spending is higher than the multiplier for taxes. So even with a balanced budget, you still get a stimulative effect in the Keynesian model. Now, in reality, we do not get, uh, we do not get multipliers at this size. Multipliers are generally much lower than this. And the reason is due to something called crowding out. Um, in the short run, in particular, interest rates rise. I already mentioned that. You have higher interest rates if you are borrowing more money. So higher interest rates mean that consumption and investment fall which neutralizes part of the stimulative effect of the change in government spending. So the multiplier is smaller. And also there's a second form of crowding out as prices rise too. And this goes back to the distinction between the vertical aggregate supply curve and the Keynesian upward sloping aggregate supply curve. But in both cases, prices rise and higher prices also mean you get some crowding out. The multiplier is less than you expect. The effect on output is less than you expect. In the extreme case, if you believe in the classical model, the multiplier is zero because you have complete crowding out. Prices rise to completely neutralize any output effect. There is no output effect because wages and prices are perfectly flexible. So in the classical model, there is no multiplier. In the Keynesian model, there is. And I think that a lot of economists have looked at what is the size of the multiplier? What is the effect of change in fiscal policy on output um, in the wake of the Great Recession? And, I, and the IMF has certainly done many studies on that and found out there is indeed a positive multiplier, but it's not big like four. It's maybe closer to one maybe one and a half, uh, it, and it's certainly higher for government spending than it is for taxes. So there is something to, uh, there is something to the, um, the assumption that the Keynesian multiplier is smaller for taxes than it is for government spending. So keep in mind, main takeaway here, Keynesian multiplier says that fiscal policy can affect output, but bear in mind there's also crowding out the simplistic example of the Keynesian multiplier I just gave you is in a sense too simplistic because it doesn't take into account that interest rates and prices will rise and neutralize some of the effects of that aggregate demand stimulus. Okay, let's look at deficits and debt. This is, I pulled this from Professor Sachs's um, slides because he didn't manage to get to it. And we'll see that in the US, we usually look at government debt as a percent of 
of, of GDP of gross domestic product. That's how we figure out its, rel its size relative to the economy. And you can see that in wars and recessions, debt goes up. So it goes up in wars because of high military spending. It goes up in recessions because in recessions, taxes fall and spending rises. Remember the automatic stabilizers that I mentioned earlier? So debt rises automatically in recessions, but it also rises for discretionary reasons. And there's a very large projected increase in, in government debt over the long term. Um, so we are at a pretty high level of debt to GDP right now. So the question you want to ask is, how harmful is a high debt GDP ratio to the economy? How harmful is it? Well, again, this is from Professor Sachs. The cost of servicing the debt is roughly I times D, the interest cost times the, the D, which is the, the debt GDP ratio. So if I is 4%, and the debt GDP ratio is 150% of GDP, the interest cost relative to GDP is 4% times 150%, so 6% of, of GDP. So that can tell you that if your interest rate is high or your debt GDP ratio is high, you are spending a lot of money each year to service that debt. And if you're spending money on debt service, that's less money you have for spending on other areas that you consider valuable, whether it's government investment, whether it's on social services, or whether it's on pandemic relief, whatever it is. But if you have high debt, what that means is you have a high level of debt service. And a lot of countries in the developing world, they tend to they have tended in the past to get into a lot of debt distress, that their debt to GDP ratio is very high, their interest rates are high, uh, and the interest costs are high. And what tends to happen is that as, debt, as, as investors think that your debt is getting towards precarious levels, that you might not be able to repay it, then I am only going to lend to you at a very high interest rate. But that creates a vicious cycle because the high interest rate in turn increases your debt service costs and reduces the chances that you're, on, you're going to be able to repay it over the long term. So you can get into a debt crisis. And we've seen this over and over again in the, in the developing world, especially since the 1970s in Latin America, in Africa and Asia. And you also often need um, you often need, if debt is not sustainable, you often need to write down that debt. You often need uh, to have a debt plan to reduce your level of debt. Um, in the early 2000s, there was a very huge campaign called the Jubilee Campaign, which wrote off the debt of a lot of very, of, of, of the debt of low income countries. Um, so they were able to spend a lot more money on healthcare and education. And remember, we talked a few classes back on the Millennium Development Goals. These Millennium Development Goals were partly successful because international institutions, including the World Bank and the IMF, agreed to write off large amounts of debt for these low-income countries. So instead of having a very large debt service, they were able to use that money to spend on things like health and education, and that, that led to better, much better uh, social outcomes in those countries. So, but the question I want to finish the class with for you today is fiscal sustainability. What does it mean? I've mentioned in passing debt sustainability. What does that mean? What does that mean if your debt is sustainable? Well, it turns out we can actually analyze that in, in technical terms. Um, in other words, it's, it's not enough just to say debt is really high. We have to look at it 
in relation to a few other variables. So let's look at your deficit. DEF is deficit, which is delta D, which is the change in your debt, um, which is G, government spending, plus TR, government transfers, things like unemployment assistance or social security, things like that. Small I times D, that's this. That's your interest costs, the cost of debt servicing, interest rate times D minus your taxes. So, your so that's your deficit, which is the change in your debt is spending plus transfers plus interest payments minus taxes. We often come up with a concept called the primary deficit, which I'm calling PDEF. The primary deficit is basically your deficit taking out interest payments. So it's so what what would your deficit be if you didn't have to pay interest payments? And that's G plus TR minus T. Let's now look at that in real terms as opposed to nominal terms. Real terms is basically, you know, adjusting for prices. And small letters are real. So just think of you're just dividing everything by prices. Keep it simple. So small d, the change in your real debt is equal to g minus t plus real interest rate times the debt, rd. And here, small t, think of it as taxes minus transfers, um, just to keep, every, to, to keep everything simple. OK. So we have this equation here. Uh, Delta D, the change in your debt, is equal to your primary deficit plus your interest payments. That's how your debt is expanding. Now, let the letter Q equals the debt GDP ratio, D over Y. Note that in the ratios, the real is the same as the nominal because the prices drop out. So price times big D over price times big Y is equal to small d over small y because the prices drop out. Um, this is your debt GDP ratio. That's, that's this. Okay. So the change, and we want to look at the change in Q, the change in the debt GDP ratio. Is it expanding or is it contracting? What matters is how it's changing. And we know that the change in Q, Q is just D over Y. So the change in Q is the change in D minus the change in Y. So the change in the debt GDP ratio is the change in the, in the numerator, which is your debt level minus the change in denominator, which is real GDP. Let real GDP, let G equal your trend growth rate. Okay. Now, go back to this equation here. The change in your debt is equal to your primary deficit plus your interest payments, RD. Divide through by D. So delta D over D equals primary deficit over D plus R, because you've divided through by D. Well, what's delta D over D? The debt, it's the change in debt. D hat is the change in debt. It's, and that's your primary deficit over D plus R. Well, what's Q? Go back to the bottom of the page. Q is the debt GDP ratio. And that is the change in debt minus the change in Y. Well, here we've got the change in debt. It's the primary deficit over D plus R. So the change in Q is just subtracting G. Okay. And now we have our final result, which is the change in Q, the change in the debt GDP ratio is equal to 
the primary deficit over debt plus R minus G. So there are three variables to keep track of here. The primary deficit, real interest rates, and real growth rates. Now, if Q hat is greater than zero, that means your debt is unsustainable because it is increasing. Your debt GDP ratio is going up and up and up. That's what that's saying because Q is your debt GDP ratio. But we can look at that. When is that increasing? Let's assume that if you have a policy, and this often happens, let's assume you have a policy of keeping the primary deficit constant, then what matters is the difference between R and G. So often you say your debt is sustainable when the real growth rate is greater than the real interest rate. In a sense, that's very intuitive because if you just think of the numerator and the denominator, um, if you think of your debt service over output over G, your debt service is growing in line with the interest rate and the denominator is growing in line with the growth rate because it's Y. So if you're looking at the ratio, what you want to make sure is that your denominator is growing faster than your numerator, then your debt becomes sustainable. So the bottom line here is it's not enough just to look at that debt GDP ratio and say, oh, it's looking really big, we're in trouble. You have to look under the hood. You have to look at the ratio of debt GDP and what's driving that ratio. And it often turns out to be the, real, the difference between real growth rate and real interest rates. So you will often hear, uh, if you read economists or you read op-eds in the New York Times or Washington Post, you will often hear arguments to the effect of, this is a great time for governments to borrow because interest rates are so low. And what they're basically arguing is that borrowing is actually pretty safe now because you have very low interest rates and those interest rates are lower than the growth rate. So you are, you're safe, your, your borrowing is pretty safe, it's sustainable. So even if it's high, it can still be sustainable. So that is basically where, where I wanted to end up, a little bit of debt sustainability. Uh, it says it's, it's, it gets back to the point that Professor Sachs mentioned that short-term fiscal policy can have long-term effects. And one long-term effect is your debt becomes unsustainable. And that depends on a number of these factors, which I talked about. Another long-term effect is if you are, you can have inflation. And we know we talked about some of that. Uh, think of the difference between the classical and the Keynesian uh, aggregate supply curve. If you think that the classical is a good approximation for what um, the long run looks like, then basically your aggregate demand is just going to lead to inflation in the long run, and that's going to be a problem. Um, okay. Okay, that was the thing for today. That's everything I wanted to talk about. Uh, let me just check something. Okay, yeah, no problem. Um, we have two or three minutes. Anybody have any comments or questions, feedback, jokes, anything? Okay, well, in that case, we'll end here. And uh, I look forward to seeing you all next week. We're going to talk about sustainable development. We're going to talk about the final topic of the course. And that's really what Professor Sachs is very well known for. He's one of the authors of the Sustainable Development Goals at the United Nations. So it's a privilege to have him talking about that next Tuesday. So you'll have, as usual, you'll have Professor Sachs on Tuesday. You'll have me on Friday.
and then a few days after that you'll have your final but i will give you i will give you um uh, instructions in advance as to what that final is going to look like and how we're going to do it it'll probably be like the midterm um uh, alexi yeah you have a question um i think wednesday is the last day of class uh may 5th if i'm not if i'm not wrong uh, i'm just saying that because you just just said that we'll have two more uh, classes. oh so i don't get so i don't have a class next friday is that what you're telling me um, I'm, I'm guessing that that's the case. Yeah, I think, I mean, May 5th is the, is the last class um, from my understanding. I don't know if the other students um, think the same. Is that, okay, is that the, if that's the case, then that's, then you did, I, I, I didn't realize, but if that's the case, then this is my last class. Um, what, what, what day is May 5th? What day is it? It's a Wednesday. Uh, I can send you the calendar, the academic calendar, if you want. Okay. I'm not. I'm not, I'm not sure if that's different for specific courses. If they if they go uh, the entire week or anything, but I can, I can find that out. But normally, it may fit as the first one. Okay. Can you find that out? Because um, yeah. and then get back to me because um, if I um, I wouldn't mind having one last class next Friday. Yeah. I mean. I agree with that too. I agree with that. We can yeah. always do a voluntary class on Friday. Um, on the understanding that we won't test you on what we do on Friday because it's too close to the final, but uh, it will be fun to. Uh, uh, it will be. I'd like to see you all one last time before I wave by, and I, and I'm really sorry that we never got to meet in person this semester. Uh, I feel, uh, I just don't like this Zoom class is not a great way to teach. I would have liked to have met you all, uh, but this is the world we're living in, unfortunately. So, yeah. Okay. Have a good weekend, everybody. As usual, I'll stay on the Zoom if anybody wants to ask any, any questions privately. But otherwise, we'll see you all on Tuesday for Professor Sachs. And let's assume that we will do one class next Friday, but that's voluntary. Um, nothing on that will be tested. Um, but uh, I'm gonna t I wanted to talk about Laudat Pope Francis's Laudato Si. So uh, I think it would be nice to end with Pope Francis uh, on a course like this. So, uh, okay. Have a good weekend, everybody. And we'll see you on Tuesday. Bye. Thank you. Have a good weekend. Yeah.